Well, uh, welcome folks to this study in our Bible study series on the book of Revelation. Let us turn straight to scripture to Revelation chapter 21, please. Revelation chapter 21. And um, would somebody kindly read the first eight verses, please? The first eight verses of Revelation 21. Yes, we've got a, a Chris, you're happy to read. Good, excellent. Um, 21, 1 to 8. Yes. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega the beginning and the end, I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Amen. May God bless his word to us this Amen. evening. Let me just... There we go. So, all... Things new. Behold, verse 5, chapter 21, verse 5. Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, mm. Right, for these words are true and faithful. And as we looked at last week, we saw the fact that the book of Revelation deals with the millennial period and it kind of moves through the millennial period very quickly, um, giving us the the most pertinent inf information, most important information regarding the millennial period of a thousand years, and then we find we we arrive at the the great white throne judgment, where we see the general resurrection of the dead, and the the earth uh, has uh, the heavens or the heaven singular and earth have already fled away, as we're told. Um, po poetically in scripture, and there is no place found for them. And so, therefore, the the great white throne judgment happens um, in, uh, in you know not on this earth, as it were, not according to the heaven um, that we are familiar with. But then, in verse twenty one, we're introduced to a new heaven and a new earth. And the first peculiarity that we can see in relation to this is in chapter twenty one, verse one, where we read, "And I saw a new heaven and a new earth." For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea, which is a, an extraordinary statement. Um, when we bear in mind, when we go back to Genesis chapter one, that we begin, in a sense, with an earth that is completely enveloped or is is, is just a, a, um, water. Uh, and the and the earth, as it were, is concealed within this greater ball um, uncovering of water. So we've gone from that to a, a new creation where there is no more sea. Now, 
I'd just like to clarify, that doesn't mean that there's no more water. There is plenty of water because, of course, in Revelation chapter two, we read of the river of life. But so there are two reasons why there is no more sea. Would anyone like to hazard a guess as to why there is no more sea on the the new heaven and uh, or in the new, on the new earth? Anyone like to hazard a guess? Out of the sea is where the evil comes from. And devil and all that stuff actually comes out of the sea. Right. So yeah, yes, that's right, Steve. So there's a there's a parallel in scripture with the fact that the the sea uh, it kind of typologically represents the abyss. It the, it's, the term is interchangeable when it's used to actually describe the sea literally or whether or not it's in, it, the, the word is used to then apply to what we would cla- what I would consider to be a spiritual dimension or a spiritual location, if such a thing, uh, we can refer to it in such a way, there is this equivalence. And just to expand upon that, we see Leviathan, who is amongst the sea. He's in the sea, and he has to be drawn out of the sea or the abyss or the deep. And the sea is also used as a metaphor for something else in scripture. Can anyone remember what that is? Why do the heathens rage? Rebellion. And imagine a faint thing. Well, yeah, it's actually it's the, it's actually the nations. So the sea is a metaphor for the nations because they are tumultuous. They are unruly in that sense they they are um yeah yeah yes we we could we could see them in that sense yeah and so so consequently we have this idea of satan and the deep uh, as a parallel as a metaphor and the sea and we we um entering into the water entering into the sea we think about jonah if we think of passing through the Red Sea, what is that also a metaphor in relation to man? What is that a metaphor of when, you know, going down to the deep, passing through the Red Sea? What is that a metaphor? In, in other words, what I'm trying to say is if, if man tries to submerge himself without any equipment in the sea, what normally happens? Yes. yes. That That's yes. right. It's an inhospitable abode. It's not, in a sense, the, the, the natural abode. Um it's an it can, be very, it can be very enticing. Like oh. I've got this, I've got the sea a few miles on my doorstep, and it's been like I've been down there a couple of times in the last couple of weeks, and it's been like a mill pond. And yes. then you think how easily it can turn and uh, and consume you mm. uh, very easily. In, in, fa- in fact, there was a plaque near near me where four. Uh, or three marines met their untimely end um and from an innocent day out um and they took a dinghy to get from one side of the river came to the other and never made it and there's a plaque on the uh, congregational church to them and so yes it can so easily consume you mm. <laughs> yeah. 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 Up. So, sorry say again ian Oh yeah, Natalia. Yeah, so Natalia, please. You, no, you... It's just, it was just an agreement to what Chris was just saying because one of my friends was in Florida a few weeks ago. You know when they were having the hurricane. Mm. Yeah. And she said she went out into the sea, was just swimming because she's really quite short. Actually, she's about maybe five foot, maybe four foot, eleven, five foot. Very much, probably even short. Yeah, very petite. So she said like she always makes sure that. You know, she's always, she only goes up to where the water comes, like to shoulder length kind of thing. Mm. And she didn't realise that there was a tidal wave storm thing and it literally just drew her out. Like, yeah. 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 And she goes, like, she turned around, she couldn't see any, she couldn't see the beach, she couldn't see, and she was the only one in the ocean as well. Mm. So, frantically, she said she learned afterwards that when, you're in that situation, you're supposed to swim diagonally, not straight, trying to get back to shore. 
but obviously she didn't know that. So yeah, it, like when she was telling me her experience, it was really really scary. Mm. It can, it can be so it can be so enticing mm. as it, as can sin. Yeah. Yes, in in that respect, yeah, that's true. That's true. So, the sea is also seen as something that's divisive, something that's divisive because it it separates the continents, and it poses um, uh, a, uh, a a barrier to the ease of travel. of of traveling on land is perceived as being safe, or at least relatively safe, um, in and of itself, sure foundation, and so. When when the Lord Jesus walks on the on the water or walks on the sea, um, this is showing his his um, authority and superiority to all of these things. So, as we said, it, it doesn't just because there's no more sea, um, which of course not a good thing to drink seawater. Uh, it's not actually um, good for us. So it that is removed. That is removed. But there is still water. But um, but we essentially have an earth which is is completely just um the the crust of the earth and um it's, it would be interesting whether or not there are, there are any lakes freshwater lakes all all that we seem to have a description of is is a river um and um and of course that in itself or statements like this found in verse 1 of chapter 21 is part of the reason why a lot of Christians, historically as well as today, will argue that the book should be understood allegorically as opposed to literally, literally, because they they will say, you know, how can you conceive of a world without uh, the sea? And um, uh, although we know that in the first creation, obviously, uh, as we said, the earth comes out of the water. In other words, it's submerged, and um, we know that the flood. Uh, another example of where water basically communicates the idea of bringing death and yet nevertheless uh, when we see for example the the great flood we we see that actually a great deal more is required of the earth in order for it to be submerged than merely for it to rain for 40 days so whilst within within the sort of parameters of sunday school um the the flood is generated uh, by the simple explanation that it rained for 40 days however in fact scripture tells us that that was not the case well it, it did rain for 40 days but there was cataclysmic events taking place upon the earth in order for the earth to then end up um being um engulfed in water and i remember reading and i can't remember the exact statistic but essentially um someone um has shared the details that if the earth was in fact as flat as a bowling ball or a billiard ball in fact or a snooker ball then i think the waters upon the earth would be something like about seven miles deep um overall um and so we we have absolutely no we have no um idea whether or not there were mountains before the flood none of these things and so we we are very much dependent upon um, just what scripture says and not going beyond that in order to envisage what these things were like however as i say that is it's, it's, it's statements like this that then uh, provoke people to imagine that um, what we're reading about is allegorical however uh, if we move on we see then verse 2 that john he says i saw the holy city new jerusalem coming down out of heaven from god prepared as a bride adorned for her husband and um there is a, another reference to this later on in the chapter where it says in verse nine we haven't read that yet but in verse nine it says then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me saying come i will show you the bride the lamb's wife now that's very much a term that we would use today to because of the book of Ephesians, we would use that to dis to describe the church. We would say that the church is the bride of Christ, bride of the Lamb. And so therefore, again, these are verses in chapter 21, verse 2 and verse 9. These are verses that provoked what I will describe as the hyper-dispensationalists. And that I don't use that term in any sort of critical or derogatory way but merely as a a means of of, of, di of distinguishing them from 
uh, mainstream, mainstream. And again, that's not to say that because I used the term mainstream that I think that's right. It's just that there are far more dispensationalists who would hold the view that the church will be present or believers, church believers will be present upon the earth in the millennium that, that you know. Um, but it's verses like this in chapter 21, verse 2 and chapter 21, verse 9, that support the idea of people. And we have talked about, I've talked about this gentleman before, Dake. You can get the Dake Study Bible. And he's an example of um, what I will describe as a hyper dispensationalist who believes that, in fact, the church remains in heaven throughout the millennium and that it is here described as, in fact, descending upon the upon the new earth and then uh it, it part of all things new and one of the arguments that i've heard put forward for this is that actually from the point at which we're raptured the idea is that we should never sort of come into contact with anything that is is not absolutely perfect that basically god is only going to give us perfection from the time that we're resurrected and raptured and we will only experience that which is perfect so we'll go to heaven and it will be perfect there in heaven and although the earth is experiencing a near edenic type bliss nevertheless there are unbelievers upon the earth and that that would mar our experience uh, the experience of perfection and it's only when there's then a new heaven and a new earth that we actually then return to the earth and there, I can understand the argument behind that, um, but the difficulty with that is that it seems as if what is being described here is not simply an allegory to describe believers, unless you fancy being a gateway or a bit of a wall in in the the new um, in the new Jerusalem. And, um, uh, and and obviously, if we do see it allegorically that way, then then that's fair enough. Um, but at the same time, it, if we seek to try and understand things as literally as we can without moving into the being driven into the fantastic or the irrational, then it would appear as if we are dealing with the description of something that has location, something that has some sort of physical experience. Um, later on in chapter 21, John is instructed just as he remember back in Revelation chapter 11, that he measures out the Jerusalem that exists in the, or that he measures out the temple, sorry, uh, that exists in the um, tribulation period. And he now that is recapitulated in Revelation chapter 21. So it says, um, verse 15, chapter 21. In fact, let's go on and read that next section. Would somebody kindly read chapter 21? Verses 9 to 21, please. Verses 9 to 21. It's a considerable chunk. Um, if you want to split it up into two, you can discuss it amongst yourselves. I'm happy to read. Oh, thank you, Ingrid. Um, excuse my Bible. It's, you know, modern. Okay. <laughs> we'll, add, we'll add the bits in that are missing. Don't you worry. <laughs> um. So um, one of the seven angels who had seven bowls full of seven of the seven last plagues came and said to me, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God. And its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, uh, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall and 12 gates, and with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates and its walls. The city was laid out like a square, as long as it was wide, measured the city with the rod, and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length, and as wide and as high as it is long. The angel measured the wall using human measurement, and it was 144 cubit, cubits thick. The wall was made of jasper, 
and the city of pure gold, as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, and the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth ruby, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, and the ninth topaz, the tenth turquoise, and the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl, a great street of the city of gold as pure as transparent glass. Thank you. So here we have the description of this uh, new Jerusalem. And um, from the dimensions, we can see that it, it is uh, an absolutely enormous structure, or at least an enormous structure in relation to the earth that we are on at the moment and it uh, it's linked directly as we know through the gates to the 12 tribes of israel and it's also linked to the uh, apostles because of the statement that they're in found in verse 14 wall of city had 12 foundations on them the names of the 12 apostles of the lamb and there's an awful lot of numerology contained here so, for example, in verse 17, there's actually another occurrence of the the, the, the number 144. So we've got the, the 144,000 the, in earlier on in Revelation, the Jews, and you've got the 144,000 in, in Revelation 14, and then you've got 144 cubits, verse 17, and he measured its wall 144 cubits according to the measure of a man that is of an angel and so there's there's a lot of when i say numerology there's a lot of numbers there's a lot of relationship between the numbers and there's an enormous amount of speculation as to what this means and that is well well beyond my capacity or interest actually to establish other than the fact that this is the perfect place to live this is the perfect place to live um, you know, we, we talk about, um, you know, uh, you know, homes under the hammer and um, uh, place a place in the sun. Um, well, this is a place in this is a place in the new heaven and the new earth. And um, there are no there's no hammers used to create it. And, you know, we say there's the phrase, isn't there? You know, location, location, location. Well, that's absolutely true here. This is the location that we all want to be in. And it's only through being in covenant with the lamb that we can uh, uh we can accomplish that and so we see this description as i said we can delve into the numbers and the design of the new jerusalem but i, I don't think there's anything compared to actually experiencing it so i'm gonna i'm gonna hold off um uh from investigating that um and and just look forward to actually experiencing it perhaps that's because um, uh, day to day I use um, in in the work that I do in construction I, I use tape measures and I use lasers and all that sort of thing and measuring rods so perhaps it's you know I just I need a, a bit of a break from that but as it says in verse 16 the city is laid out as a square and the it is in fact the city of Jerusalem it's the city of Jerusalem and part of this plays into um, what we call um, systems of of, of um, triunities systems of triunity so as we've talked about before um, my apologies i haven't got a slide to communicate this to you but as we've talked about before you have what we call the temple typology and so the temple typology you've got the holy the holy of holies right in the very very center and then you've got the around that you've got the holy place and um and then around that you have the um in fact i tell you what let's let me just open something else and um and let's go somewhere else right so hopefully every hopefully everyone can see the temple pattern there okay so I'm sure I've gone through, or I certainly read, um, mentioned these sorts of things before. So we've got 
uh, the Holy of Holies, which is which is actually the the little central area there with the Ark, and then we've got the Holy Place, and then you've got the outer courtyard. So this is actually the tabernacle, um, but essentially the um, the temple works on the same basis. It's uh, it's a box in a box in a box. That's how it works. So you've got the Holy of Holies, you've got the Holy Place, which in the temple would include the court of Israel for those that can worship. And then you've got the outer court or the court of the Gentiles. And this basically replace this this relates to man's tripart structure. Man's tri tripart structure. So man is body, soul, and spirit. And the so the the actual temple represents it's like um it's like a visual plan of 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 man's anthropological uh ex existence and condition of existence that we have a spirit soul and body and obviously the holy of holies was where who dwells who dwells in the holy of holies lord that's right the lord alone that's that's his, that's his abode that's made that's his that's his room as it were in this house so it's his house but that's explicitly where he he abides and so that's why god created a spirit in man in order for man as it, god to be able to relate to man man to relate to god that's the thing that we have in common with god that brings about a union because what we have in common brings about a union that's the basis of the word communion and so we've got spirit soul and body the soul obviously relates to the holy place that's where the business of the temple uh, um, took place from day to day and the ceremony and then you've got the outer court the court of the gentiles and re was referred to as such because the gentiles could enter the outer court they could go in and out and so we can appreciate the fact that this represents man the fact that man uh, in our bodies which equates to the outer court in our bodies we have external stimulus and uh, we can experience things and obviously in our fallen state they can have a massive impact upon us uh they can in fact uh invade into the soul so you know we we suffer a physical trauma that causes us angst in our soul uh, we can experience psychological trauma that causes us angst in our soul because sadly um in the fallen world we we are not this this perfect uh, triunity with god existing in in our spirit and his nature and his integrity being shared with our soul and our body as believers today as believers today we can experience god in our soul in our consciousness we can be conscious we can be aware of him in, in our mind emotions and our will but we actually have to we have to consciously assert that otherwise we have another mind our old mind and our old will which and our old emotions uh, that, that are perfectly happy and familiar to operate and so uh, we are we're kind of in a in a state of um, we're in a state of flux so originally originally uh, man was ruled by our spirit that defined our soul and then our body would express that and sadly after the fall we find ourselves in the position where we are essentially ruled by our body and our soul is subject to our body and then our spirits are, are dead in trespasses and sins. In other words, not performing the function or the full function that God created our spirit for. And so although it still acts to provide us with a conscience, as Paul talks about in Romans chapter 2, the law written upon our hearts, that is because we have a spirit that provides us with a foundation of, of conscience. But... Um, no more than that and so uh what i'm sort of driving at i'm not sure if i've actually got it included in this i don't think i do oh yes here we go right so one of the things uh in understanding the typology of the temple is actually there are various triunities in scripture there are various triunities in scripture that are used to communicate to a certain spiritual truths so, in fact, the first temple typology, the very first temple typology precedes the existence of the tabernacle or temple. And it actually goes back to the original created order. And so we see here the parallel with we've got body, soul and spirit on the left 
meaning uh, representing man. And then we have Earth, Eden, and the Garden being a, a triunity that's mentioned in, in um, Genesis chapters 1 and 2, or in chapter 2. And so we know that Eden is, is part of the Earth, or within the earth, as it might be rephrased in your Bible, and then the garden is a sub-element within Eden. So we have we have the garden in Eden in the earth. And therefore, what we can understand from that is that whatever takes place in the garden has spiritual significance to man. That is what this is is explaining. Now, I appreciate this is typology, I appreciate this is this is not things that we often familiarly talk about to this depth even it's very often things that are not preached about and and mentioned and so i'm not saying that a believer has to know this in order to understand the bible that's not that's not true these are just very very useful um structures and elements within scripture that because of our greek way of reading the bible um we we try to analyze the bible sort of as a as a as a sort of scientific paper um we we can miss the the illustrative elements within scripture that are designed to teach us things um but by no means am i advocating us going into as i was saying we've like looking at the temple in in revelation chapter 21 sort of esoteric um reading significance into numbers and, and these things i'm not suggesting that um i'm not suggesting that we over spiritualize the literal that we read in revelation sorry in genesis for example um, you know, there really was the earth, there really was Eden, there really was the garden. There was a drama that took place within the garden. It had spiritual significance, but I'm not suggesting that that drama actually took place, as it were, within man's spirit. I'm not taking the typology that far. All I'm saying is that the Bible contains these elements and these structures in order to communicate to us that what happened had a spiritual significance. Although, having said that, obviously... Um, after the fall um man is I've, uh, man is um as we can see man is in fact barred there is the there is the the obstacle of sin as it were um and very you know and going back to the original temple sorry going back to the original temple typology obviously um no go back here sorry my apologies um you know you couldn't enter into the holy of holies you couldn't enter into the Holy of Holies just as after the fall, um, just after as after the fall, there was the the flaming sword and the cherubs present who would bar entrance to the garden. So there are parallels, hopefully, that we can see there um, that existed. And so there was that barrier to communion between God and man. Man is ejected from the garden, and so in a sense, man is ejected from having spiritual communion with God. These are all things that uh, are being communicated by that. And where I was actually going with this is that there's another triunity within scripture. There's another triunity, which is what we can see here is the temple, Jerusalem and the land of Israel. That is, an, that is another triunity. And so when we read, for example, about armies, armies trying to invade the land of Israel. The this is this is typologically this represents the principalities and powers trying to dominate us through our flesh. The armies trying to invade and take control of the land. They take the they take the produce of the land, which is you know the the, the word of God. So the principalities and powers try and rob us of the the crops. The crops make bread. Bread is an analogy for the word of God. Man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So the principalities and powers come in. They try and rob the crops that would be made to use bread. They're trying to rob the word of God. Remember, what's what's Gideon doing? What's Gideon doing when you know he's threshing the wheat in, in secret? He's threshing the wheat because otherwise the... I think it's the was it the Midianites? I can't remember now. I think it was the Midianites would would come and take it, and so with this this is the analogy. At the same time, of course, they would take 
they would take the best animals. They would take the best animals. And of course, what were the best animals meant to? They were meant to be the animals used for sacrifice. And so again, the principalities and powers try and rob us of the 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 um the appreciation of the focus of the understanding of the sacrifice of christ this is what the principalities and powers are always trying to do now again i don't want us to try and i'm not trying to make this into some mental thing in our minds where we're there thinking that the principalities and powers are trying to rob us of our thoughts or 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 rob us of our of our a peace of mind that's not what i'm meaning i'm meaning That, that these days working through culture working through the narrative of our society that is how principalities and powers work but they are in a sense represented and, and i emphasize that word represented not as a direct equivalent to as i said invading armies seeking to come in and so in the story of israel and judah or judah particularly what happens is eventually eventually the land of israel becomes under foreign rule And then Jerusalem eventually comes under foreign rule. And then when the, the Jews have been very, very rebellious to God, don't forget, even though they're being rebellious to Nebuchadnezzar, God had said to them, serve Nebuchadnezzar. So they're being rebellious to God when they're being rebellious to Nebuchadnezzar. And what happens? Nebuchadnezzar comes and he desolates the temple. And that also, as we've talked about before, is recapitulated in Daniel's 70th week. That's recapitulated in Daniel's 70th week, but in a kind of a uh, converse way where the, the, the Jews are going to build the temple. That is a profanity to God. That is a reproach to God because they're all, you know, he, he has provided sacrifice through the Lord Jesus Christ. And because they build that temple and they reestablish the um, sacrifices, what does God do? That's disobedience towards him. So the Antichrist, like Nebuchadnezzar, comes and he takes that away. He takes the sacrifice away. Just as Nebuchadnezzar desolated the temple, the Antichrist will desecrate the the um, the tribulation temple. But the point I'm just making here, when I eventually arrive at it, is in relation to the fact that we have this triunity. And then if we read on in Revelation chapter 21, from from verse 22 where ingrid finished if we read on in revelation chapter 21 from verse 22 it says but i saw no temple in it for the lord god almighty and the lamb are its temple the city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it for the glory of god illuminated it the lamb is its light and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it its gates shall not be shut at all, at all by day for there shall be no night there there shall be no night there now whether that means there will be no night at all or whether or not there will just be no night within the temple is open to interpretation verse 26 and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it but there shall by no means enter into, into anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie but only those who are written in the lamb's book of life so we have this uh, vision of the the of the new heaven and the new earth and we have the new jerusalem but we don't have we don't have a temple or at least the temple that we have we're told is the lord god almighty and the lamb are its temple and so what this means is that i, I can't represent it here on this particular slide but what it means is that the distinction between the temple and Jerusalem, the temple is removed. And so going back to one of these images here, going back to here, we've got body, soul, but there's no there's no temple. Now, that doesn't mean there's no spirit. OK, that doesn't mean that God there's no spirit what it means is that there is a perfect unhindered synthesis between man's soul and the spirit it means there's a perfect synthesis there's absolutely no distinction we completely uh, can appreciate the nature of god and god can be not exhaustively but completely expressed through man which is 
and I don't, I'm not meaning this in some sort of Eastern mysticism. I'm simply meaning it in the fullness of humanity. And again, that doesn't mean that man won't actually have a spirit in the future. That's not what I'm suggesting. I'm not suggesting that man will not have a distinct spirit whereby man continues to be body, soul and spirit. But what I'm explaining is that this is the significance of why it says that there is no temple. There's no physical temple because the synthesis because the communion between god and uh, man will be so perfect and so complete there is no need of a physical structure to represent that relationship there's no need of a physical structure to um, represent that relationship because it says that the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. In other words, God abides with Lamb. Sorry, with man, not Lamb. God abides with man. So going right the way back, remember in the Garden, in the Garden of Eden, the voice of God, the voice of God would um, come and walk in the cool of the day. Man could walk with God in the Garden. In the Garden, it's the voice or the sound of God because that represents the fact that Christ would bring revelation, that because it was, it's the pre-incarnate Christ who would walk with Adam and Eve, or certainly with Adam in the garden. And yet now it's the lamb. It's the lamb who will dwell with man. Why? Because it's looking back at the complete sacrifice and the complete um, ministry that Christ has fulfilled. So one looks forward and one looks back. And as we're told in... Um, so we're told it says the nations, um, they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into the holy Jerusalem. And so whilst it clearly there are there, there's a distinction, there are different nations, but there is absolutely no um, there isn't the outer court of the Gentiles and then the court of Israel. Rather, this is a city. Uh, this is this is a, an absolute fulfillment of when the Lord Jesus says, um, this is to be a house of prayer for all nations. Well, Jerusalem is the city of communion for, for all peoples. And as it says, any who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life are free to enter in. It's not just for the Jewish people, although, as we're told earlier on in chapter 21, their names are on the gates of Jerusalem, showing that this this is this this belongs to them. This is this is all about um their, their ultimate fulfillment and and obviously we talk about how in a sense this earth and this heaven are because they're completely synthesized with god in his nature we talk about how in a sense that this earth and this heaven have entered into the eternal order the eternal order of absolute perfection where there can be no change as it talks about the fact there'll be no weeping no sorrow um all of these things have passed away. As it says in verse four, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. And so all things, as it says, all things are new. And of course, that begins for us, as we know, with the Lord Jesus Christ in his first coming where he began the new creation. We are part of that new creation, although every time I look in the mirror, I, I don't see it. Um, and uh, But nevertheless, the Lord tells me, and I believe that, that it's true by his word. And so uh, that which is of God, that which is of him uh, will be in the new Jerusalem. And then just finally, we we have two statements within chapter 21. Obviously, there are no original chapter or verses in Revelation, but we have these two statements that, that um, occur within this section, within Revelation, where in verse 8 of chapter 21, it says, But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable murderers, sexually immoral sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death that occurs in chapter 21 verse 8 or that's where it's recorded and so the the lake of fire the lake of fire is where unbelievers will go for eternity the lake of fire is where unbelievers will go for eternity so the passage is chapter 21 clearly uh, shows the fact that there is a new heaven and there is a new earth for those who are new creations those who are part of the new creation and there is the lake of fire for all those who 
have rejected the new creation, who have rejected Christ, who have rejected God, who have rejected the testimony of conscience, the testimony of the creation, uh, the testimony of our ignorance and our need of revelation from God, and they will be in the lake of fire. Don't laugh, it's not meant to be funny, but no, I know, I appreciate it. I, I came up with what I felt was potentially the most humorous way of representing it. But notice also it says in verse in verse 27 of chapter 21, verse 27, it says, in reference to the Holy Jerusalem, it says, but there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Now, some people read that, some people will read that and they'll say, ah, so does this mean that in the new heaven and the new earth, there are things that can defile or cause an abomination or a lie, but then just not allowed in the new Jerusalem? So some people kind of read it that way. That is not what that verse means. What this verse means, it's what it do is categorically stating that there will be nothing that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, not just in the Holy Jerusalem, but because they're not present in the Holy Jerusalem, they're not present in the new earth, the new heaven and the new earth either. It's simply drawing a parallel. It's simply drawing a parallel and reinforcing that. And because it's already we've already been told in verse eight of chapter 21 that there will be no there will be no sinners. There'll be no sin. There'll be no evil in the new heaven and the new earth. It will simply be God's goodness um, uh, permeating everything. And so there, th that statement in verse 27, it doesn't mean as some uh, suspect that there. you know, and also I think I'm right in saying the JWs. The JWs believe that everybody gets resurrected, that nobody goes to the lake of fire and everybody's on the new heaven and the new earth. And so so unbelievers end up sort of outside the, the holy Jerusalem. They they end up outside the new Jerusalem. So everyone gets resurrected. Everyone kind of gets some sort of a positive um, future, but they're just outside the, the, the new Jerusalem, the holy Jerusalem. And I think I'm right in saying I'm not 100 percent on my JW doctrine, but I think they basically just argue that these people are almost like two dimensional and they ha they have no grasp of of what their existence really is beyond just sort of like physical phys physical functioning in that sense um if, if anybody knows a little bit more about it please do feel free to share um but having looked at something which is rather um rather hot we can look at the opposite of that something that cools us down and so continuing on into chapter 22 because really we're dealing with a literary section um, that begins at the beginning of chapter 21, but actually goes into chapter 22. And it says, and he showed me a pure river of water of life. So there's the, there's the proof that there is water. Um, that there might not be any sea, as we're told in chapter 21, verse 1, but there is water clear as crystal proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. So it's very reminiscent of the 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 uh, water that will come forth at jesus's second coming um but not identical to it in the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life which bore 12 fruits each tree yielding its fruit every month the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations uh, and there shall be no more curse but the throne of god and of the lamb shall be in it and his servants shall serve him they shall see his face and his name shall be on their foreheads. Again, going back to the 144,000. But now that state, that condition has passed to all. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp. Just reasserting those points that had already been made. They need no lamp nor light of the sun for the Lord God gives them light and they shall reign forever and ever. And then what this follows the, the epilogue, which we will look at next week. So, all in all, we have the introduction then in Revelation chapter 21. We have the, the introduction of the new heaven and the new earth and the overall state and condition of that where God's nature completely and fully permeates the new heaven and the new earth. Um, in contrast to verse 8, where there are those who will not experience goodness anymore in the lake of fire. So that reconciles, that reconciles all all human existence in eternity future 
either you are part of the new heaven and the new earth or you will have your part in the lake of fire so that's what that section does in revelation chapter 21 and then first nine onwards it deals with the we could say the infrastructure of the the new creation it we go from the superstructure the superstructure the externals the outward the the uh the overall um structure to the internals we look at the new jerusalem which is there to emphasize there to emphasize the fact that god and man are dwelling together in perfect unity that god and man are dwelling together in perfect unity and then we have the river of life to show the um the fact that we you know there were there were the four rivers there were the four rivers that proceeded uh from the the river head either uh well, to the east of eden or or some people read it as that it's the origin of those rivers being just to the east of eden some read it as the mouths of the river were near the east of eden you you can argue it for either way we won't reconcile that tonight um but the point is that here we have the river of life proceeding from the new jerusalem and and we we see it's the fruit it fruits every month and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations now um people can read that statement in the end of verse 2 chapter 22 and they can see that they can read that and they'll say oh does that mean that there are problems then that need healing you know because if the healing is needed does that mean that there are problems or does that mean that the nations the nations the the, the non-jews in the new heaven and the new earth can somehow suffer harm or experience uh, illness or something like that and in reality that's not actually what it means uh, what it means is we understand we have the distinction between fruit and leaves. And again, this goes back to the Garden of Eden. This goes back to the Garden of Eden. This this goes back to um th this this goes this goes back to um obviously the the um the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And here we have the tree, uh, the tree of life um and the 12 fruits. And the the it mentions the fruit every month, which is communicating um, the the sustaining of life, and then the leaves of the trees. The le leaves relate to works. The re the leaves relate to works. You remember, it was through the leaves that man sought to cover up his nakedness, meaning and uh, representing man's works. It was man's effort to solve man's works in the physical world to solve a spiritual problem so leaves represent works remember when jesus comes to the fig tree he finds leaves but no fruit when jesus came to israel in his, his first coming they were full of religious ritual but they didn't have the fruit not necessarily the fruit of the spirit but the fruit of the law which was to arrive at the need of christ they didn't see the need of christ they saw their works as being sufficient that's what that that represents so what it's talking about here is the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. What that's actually meaning is that the nations will do the right works. The nation, everyone, in fact, will do the right thing. They will they will act or they will fulfill in their actions perfectly what it means to be a, a cre God created human being. That's what it's meaning. It's finding fulfillment. It's not it's not healing something that's deficient. It's arriving at the fulfillment of something, at the perfection of something. So in other words, everyone will act. Everyone will act uh, in purity. And but there will arguably still be learning. People will learn new things. Um, you know, they, it, everyone doesn't enter into eternity we don't have godlike knowledge of uh, of ev exhaustive knowledge of everything so so believe it or not there will still be classes at your local um your local community center uh, wherever you are on the earth so so there'll still be community centers and you can learn your basket weaving and and all these sorts of things and you'll be perfect at it you'll be absolutely perfect at it and and Thank that you. at the end of the day when it, when it really comes down to it that's really what we're all aiming for isn't it being yeah. being perfect basket weavers <laughs> or basket cases well i didn't want to say that because I, I didn't want to put didn't want to put some um, words into anyone's mouth but yeah, yeah. but um yeah.
But there we go. So there, won't be, there won't be any basket oh, cases. I no. was just about to say, but how much more perfection do you need, Chris? <laughs> <laughs> lots. He's lots, weaved, lots. He's weaved ask, a good basket there. Ask my wife. Will be the basket case. <laughs> yeah, ask my wife. Yeah, I'm Absolutely. well qualified in the basket case department. <laughs> Anyway, okay. So, any any thoughts, comments, questions that people would like to share now for the video um, before we go to our our select after party session for all of you people that turn up. <clears throat> yeah, just just one thought about the new Jerusalem. Yeah, is, please, um, Andrew. It's, you know, it says there's no day, no night there, and even the sun doesn't light it up. And it mentions it more than once. Uh, and that the Lord himself is the light of it. Uh, well, actually, if, if we look at our sort of current order of things, they're just uh, at, in the depths of the city because it's so high and, and you assume it's not empty space. So if it's filled up with... Um, uh, Sort of levels and floors there's no way the sun would ever reach in there yeah. and, and so it's actually it's a it's a it's a purely scientific fact that basically god has to provide the light for it mm. um, yeah 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 that's that's a brilliant point and um and the fact that he his that, you know it's it's obviously it's conveying spiritual truth and the fact that his light permeates every corner it, it lights everything uh, and there is nothing there to obstruct his light. Nothing has the. It goes back to John chapter one, um, and you know there was the darkness could not comprehend or apprehend or resist the light. So there's nothing to resist. And um, yeah, absolutely, A any natural light would be uh, um, would, would would not be suitable to accomplish that, as you say, Andrew. So um, you know, God in that sense provides that, and uh, and and that is. Um, that transcends the reality that we exist today, both spiritually and, and physically as well. So, yeah, absolutely. Any other th thoughts or comments for the video before we move on to our select privileged after party for those of us dedicated to, to faithfully turn up week in and week out? No. Okay. Ian, would you like to close in prayer for us, please? If, if you don't mind, brother, if I can uh, impose upon you. Impose indeed. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We're looking into these wonderful things, Father, in Revelation, the latter book, the latter chapters. We see a glorious future, which obviously we don't fully understand, but we mm. just... Thank you, Father, that when you left, you said you'd go to prepare a place for us. And so we're mm -hmm. so thankful. We just praise your name and glorify your name, Father. Let us be enriched by your word, for we do have a glorious future in Christ. Amen. 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 Amen.